Jay Gurudev, so lovely to be here. I was very curious. Um, at that time in my life, I was I had um, been searching in spirituality for about 15 years. I'd done a lot of different um, uh, spiritual practices like martial arts, Qigong, Tai Chi, um, energy healing work for, for 10 years, um, a lot of different stuff. and. I had pretty much achieved everything I wanted to do, but I still felt that there was something missing. I hadn't found that the thing that I was looking for, and something was driving me forwards. I knew I I wanted to um, I wanted to find an enlightened um, Kriya master because I was very interested in Kriya yoga at that time. Um, it's hard to... <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> it really is. I, I felt that that was just something that I, 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 had, to, I had to do. I, I just felt like, yes, this is something I really need to look into. This is something that I feel that I need to investigate. But I was looking for a career master and I went to a couple of organizations and, and listened to some talks and nothing was catching me. And at that time, um, Paramahansa Vishwananda wasn't giving um, Atma Kriya. He hadn't started teaching yet. And so I, I prayed to Mavatar Babaji, you know, please guide me to an enlightened Kriya master. And obviously, about half a year later, he actually started teaching Kriya. And so I was like, okay. And so at that time, I, my relationship with him was, I was like, okay, checking, okay, who is he? I heard he's an incarnation of the love of God. His title at that time that he used a lot was Prem Avatar. Prem is um, the term used, the name used for this um, divine unconditional love, um, as, as, as opposed to PR, which is limited love, conditional love. So Prem, unconditional love of God, an avatar, descent of God's divine love. So, um, I went to a lot of darshans in the UK. Um, I met him a number of times, um, and I spot, started spending more time with the devotees and, and doing the prayers. And I really love the sacred ceremony. Like for me, when I smelled the incense, the ringing of the bell, I was like, "Yes, I'm home." And it was very much the the path that also attracted me a lot as well, not just his his presence and the way he was. So my dev my connection with him was one of a lot of interest and inquiry. Um, I was always a bit like gurus, mm, not sure about that. But um, slowly getting to know him, there was one thing that, that surprised me very much, was when he, um, uh, he'd come to England a few times and it happened to be the day of my birthday. And later on in the afternoon, one of the devotees called me and he said, um, you know, um, have you been checking your phone? And I said, uh, no. And he said, uh, Guruji's been trying to call you uh, and he couldn't get hold of you and he wanted to call you to wish you a happy birthday. And I went, what? Like, call me? Why would he call me? It's like, on my birthday, I was like, I was really touched, you know, I was like really surprised. I was like, oh, wow. And he, and he said, anyway, Guruji just wants to say that he, he wishes you a happy birthday. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, I was quite surprised that he'd be thinking of me. I was like, why would he think of me? So, um, these little things, they had their, their impact and I found that um, at one point I was looking for the Divine Mother and the Divine Father, but in this state of perfect balance. And it was about um, 2006 that I, I had this experience of just knowing and feeling His presence and seeing this perfect balance between the Divine Mother and the Father in one being. And I was like, yes, that's what I'm looking for. And then I begin to identify, yes, this is my spiritual master, more, more so from then further onwards. Um, well, that was a surprise, um, not something I was planning. So uh, when I was about 18, I read a story about some um, Buddhist monks living in Scotland, and they would come down from the mountains, they would 
uh, meet some people and they would take them into the mountains to live for a whole year. Like, they didn't have a place to live, they would wander in the mountains and live from God's fortune and abundance just with what they had, the clothes that they were wearing. And I was thinking, wow, that's really interesting. Maybe I'll do something like that one day. Uh, ten years goes past. <laughs> yeah, fast forward. Ten years later, I am with Guruji in Switzerland. I've just attend attended a Yagna and I wanted to get um, a selfie with him, the two of us together in a, in a shot. And we just come out of a church and he was sitting on the fence and I said, uh, do you mind, can, I, can we get a picture together? And he said, yeah, of course. So I was so happy, like, this is the moment. So I stand next to him and he's sitting on the bench and somebody takes the picture and I'm super happy. And he turns to me and he says, so what's, uh, what's your plans? And I said, um, uh, I don't know, I'll probably just come down to this church tomorrow and visit it. And he said, no, about becoming a monk. And I went, it's like the lightning came out of the blue sky and hit me and I was totally shocked. My mouth wouldn't work. It was like on the floor. And then he said, so? <laughs> and I was still shocked. I didn't know how to talk. And I was like, okay, um, well, if I'm going to make a decision like that, I need to make the decision with my heart. So give me a year. And he had a big smile on his face. And I was thinking, did I say the right thing? So after that, um, it was as if I had made the decision and it was as if I didn't need to make the decision. Everything in life conspired. After six months, I was um, at Guruji's cousin's house and I was being initiated by him. So on the 7th of July 2007, I was initiated as a monk. It's a life um, lived for the purpose of um, one spiritual path. And this is the first and foremost um, focus that one should have when one becomes a monk or a nun. Now obviously it depends which tradition you're going in. Um, having um, a living master in one's life, a God-realized master that can take you to God-realization, um, it's very important that when one is given an instruction by him or her, then if one is a monk, one has taken that step to the direction of the first basis in many monastic orders is the first rule is obedience. Because what happens, it's very easy to have pride. No, actually, I know better. Somebody may have asked me to do this, but actually, I know the best. So let's just pause that advice and I'll do what I need to do. In the taking of the monastic vow, one takes that, that step of obedience, where it's um, maybe my cup is not full, and maybe the information and the knowledge that I have, I need to empty it out so that I can fill it with the wisdom of the spiritual teacher, the spiritual master. So uh, this is the first understanding that the change should happen within the mind, that the master might say, stay where you are, you still need to perform your, your work and your service in the world. You may still need to live in London or wh and do whatever you need to do. But if there is a time that I ask you and I call you uh, to live in an ashram or to start a spiritual center or whatever it is, um, that instruction is given. One should try one's very, very best to follow that. And so one must not then, if one understands my purpose is to fulfill the, the wishes of the, my, my spiritual master because it's actually for me to help me along the spiritual path to attain the purpose I've come here as a human being, then I shouldn't have an attachment to uh, what I am doing and the focus that I have in my life at the moment. I should be prepared to be in that state where if it's asked, I have to move, I have to change my location, I have to change my, my work in the world, that I can at a moment's notice do that. And so that's a, a mindset change, a click, where you should be prepared to uh, be renounced to those forms of attachment that you have. There are many monks and nuns that we have in Bhakti Marga that don't live in an ashram. They live in a city. They might live with the, the mother and their father. They are doing the same job that they did before they were initiated. But the point is that there's that click within the mind that if the master asks 
Okay, now I need for you to perform a different um, service in the world, a different service for your spiritual path, for others. And they are expected to leave that geographical place, they change the job, um, they change their relationships, then that is understood automatically. And so that's, that's an intrinsic change that needs to happen. It does, it depends on the individual and obviously um, the teaching should be there from the get-go, from the beginning, so that they have that understanding that this is now what's required of me, this is what I'm taking on. Because it's not, when anybody um, uh, receives initiation as a brahmacharya, as a brahmacharini, as a monk or nun, they are choosing to step into another way of living and another purpose of living. A purpose is um, very different to working a nine-to-five job and just accruing money and, and, and assets and wealth. It's different for some people in that it can take them more time to come to that. And knowing that it's going to be difficult to let go of perhaps the family circle, um, my life as it is been up till now, when they're ready to make that change, then they'll be ready to take that initiation. But there sh certainly shouldn't be, yes, I'll jump into an initiation and then five months later, oh, now I'm ready. It should be really a concomitant thing where it comes together. Like, I feel ready, I understand it fully, and I'm able to take that step. And some people it takes much longer than others. Uh, simplicity. It's challenging to get up every morning um, in the, the depths of the winter time at six o'clock in the morning on, 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 you know, because if you live outside in the world, you, I guess most people can get up like seven o'clock, eight o'clock, you know, and off they go to work. But the, the, the lifestyle that I have, this lifestyle of a service to the divine, it requires discipline. And so one of the, uh, the let's say, the, the consequences to that lifestyle is um, performing um, a worship to the, to the divine in every morning, every evening. So we have to get up at a certain time to be able to, to be ready to perform that worship. So yeah, that means getting up at six. Well, um, yes, I did have that fear because <clears throat> Um, it wouldn't always be my, my, my choice to, to wear a dhoti. Um, due to practical reasons, going up and down ladders, there have been many times when I've trodden on this and tried not to fall up or down a ladder or down the stairs. And sometimes I think these are very impractical uh, clothing sometimes to wear for practical purposes. Um, that's just a, a, a tiny example. Before being initiated, I had this a certain concern about loss of freedom because the point of obedience is um, if a spiritual master is you're taking the shelter of a spiritual master you're taking the shelter of a teaching that um, direction that um, uh, instruction is given in such a way to help to bring you to a goal and the problem with the mind is the mind is very ah I would like to be able to do this I'd like to be able to do that and when uh, a contrary um, instruction is given or, or um, maybe not even an instruction, like um, duties. So for example, I'd like to just have a walk in the mountains, but no, I actually have to be present and I have to be able to, to be, uh, I have to perform a, a sacred ceremony. Um, sometimes we like to have that freedom for ourselves, personal freedom. But uh, the lifestyle requires that you, you have to be with people, you have to be able to be connected with people, you have to put in a lot of different work or different working hours. I had that fear of, of losing that freedom, but um, the, the beautiful thing is that uh, a lot of people don't understand that you actually gain freedom through discipline. And this is something that's very liberating, because the problem is that the mind is the thing that, that, that chains us to uh, suffering a lot of the time because it's based on expectation and the thoughts that we have. You know, we want to be able to do this, that. We have so many ideas about what we want to do, how we could do it. 
And when things don't work out the way that we want or expect, that's when we get unhappy. But discipline helps us, if we can train that mind, to not go into expectation, but to accept what life brings. You're not going to fight with life. You're going to accept life on life's terms. And that's when you don't really have a problem with life. Okay, it's like that. Okay, it's like that. No worries. Let's go with the flow.